So he's touched upon this. He's trying to prove out his case for the, Im the dual imminency of the rapture versus and the great day of the Lord, the great tribulation period. And he's made a good conclusion out of bad evidence. He's taking the first Revelation 3.16, which has the word regurgitation in it to prove a point which isn't true. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit, regurgitation, vomit you out of my mouth. 3.16, Revelation. That means they're no longer saved. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me, from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich in white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I shall have to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So we're reading the passage. There's some figurative speech here. To those whom I love I reproved and disciplined. Oh, these are believers. Therefore be zealous and repent. But they're wayward believers. Before I stand at the door and knock, and everyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He thinks this is the salvation passage. It's diner. You're having dinner. You're having fellowship. He overcomes and will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. That's a reward. Not every believer gets to be that uh, glorified. As I, I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He was an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's a message secondary to the churches. But uh, if you don't repent of, of your lukewarmness, uh, you're no longer a believer or you never were. Well, this is what he says. To the Laodicean church, Christ communicates in part as follows. Thus, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am about to spew you out of my mouth. The metaphor of lukewarmness derives from the water supply to the city, and liking, unlike neighboring Hierapolis, which had hot spring water valuable for medicinal purposes, and neighboring Colossae, which had cold, refreshing to the taste water, Laodicea had tepid water that was sickening to drink on either a hot or a cold day. This figure expresses the revulsion of Christ over the church's spiritual state. So there is a spiritual state. It is the church. These are believers in view. He's using that word. The church people were not just spiritually men mature or complacent, what were they? Neither was their problem just that of having some interest in the things of God, but falling short of the true testimony of Christ? So the true testimony, that, what does that mean? That they're not true believers. What else am I going to assume? Uh, assume? The passage in Revelation 3 indicates that we just read that Jesus is addressing believers, not false professors or unbelievers. Take another look, especially at the underlined words. So we read this. I get to the underlying words. I buy, advise you to buy me from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich in white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I have to anoint your eyes and so that you may see. Unbelievers don't get this opportunity. Right? They're not, they're, they have the true testimony of Christ but they're just not living up to it. Well, you know, we're children of God. Some are wayward children. Most of us, I don't think any of us, or not, at one moment or another, temporarily, every day. There is, to those whom I love, I reprove and discipline those who be zealous and repent. Those whom I, Jesus, loves and reproves and discipline are believers, not unbelievers. They're not blind the true testimony of Christ. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Believers, are, Unbelievers aren't in view. To invite Jesus into fellowship with you, have dinner with you, has the believers in view. Unbelievers must first believe, then they have the opportunity to have fellowship with Jesus. So this is a growing in the faith issue. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So to overcome in order to receive rewards. The throne position, that's the position of authority in heaven, has believers in view, not unbelievers. He's just going off from the deep end. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Believers are in view, who are enabled to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, not unbelievers. So he's made a mistake there. Neither was their problem just that of having some interest in the things of God, but falling short of the true testimony of Christ. Their plight was far worse. No, it wasn't. 
They need to grow. They're going to get disciplined. Lukewarm describes those who have professed Christ hypocritically and whose actions betray that their hearts are not in what they pretend to be. So they're not believers. But he's calling them believers. He says he loves them. Oh, we all love unbelievers. He's twisting and turning this thing. This is all not true. The word lukewarm can only be used relative to the Christian faith of believers. It cannot be used to describe unbelievers relative to their Christian faith. Unbelievers have no opportunity to be anything but unbelievers. They have no temperature, such as lukewarm, hot, cold, relative to their relationship with Jesus Christ, not even cold. Furthermore, one is not a believer if he has always professed Christ hypocritically and never once exercised a true moment of faith alone in Christ alone for eternal life. On the other hand, believers can be hypocritical in their Christian lives. They can even stop believing moment to moment. But that does not make them lose their salvation, does it? Because salvation is by grace through a moment of faith alone in Christ alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By the way, there is no such thing as an hypocritical faith. I hypocritically believe that it's light outside. Stay time. That means you don't believe. You, can't, you don't need the word hypocritical. I just don't believe. Faith is simply a mental acceptance, assent, and something is true. It is either on or off. It cannot be hypocritical or false. You can't have a false face. You don't believe. You can be a liar and say, I believe, and don't mean it. That's, that could be, uh, yeah, but that's not, you're not, you don't have a hypocritical faith. You're just lying. So anyway, here's a study on believing. Believe.htm. So you buy the dictionary. I just use the dictionary. You can't change the meaning of words to suit your own purposes. So faith cannot be hypocritical because it would not be faith at all. The word faith cannot be hypocritical because it would not be faith at all, not having been actually expressed. Moving on, Revelation 3.15. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you would be, you were cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spit you, vomit you out of my mouth. Now, Robert Thomas says Christ's description of them in Revelation 3, 15 to 16 markedly resembles his denunciation of the religious authorities of his day for their hypocrisy in Matthew 23. They were unbelievers. They weren't hypocritical. They didn't even feign believing. They didn't believe in Jesus. They, they picked up rocks and tried to kill him. Matthew 23, Jesus Christ chastises them mercilessly and he should and he did they were unbelievers they weren't hypocritical believers just cherry picking this but that does not mean those in view in revelation 3 15 to 16 because what he said in matthew 23 are unbelievers like those unbelievers whom jesus denounced in matthew 23 does it you can't compare the two contexts believers can act quite unfaithfully even worse than before they became believers and they can stop believing the issue is a moment of faith gets you eternal life. Keeping on believing doesn't get you more eternal life. You already got eternal life. But keep, continue to be faithful gets you rewards in that eternity, which you enjoy your relationship with Jesus Christ all the more. The, the position in the throne. You share the throne with Jesus. Only if you've been persevering in the faith. Robert L. Thomas says, however, a nominal Christian who cannot see his need for repentance is a hopeless case. Where does it say that? There's always hope. 1 John 1 9. Confess your sins, you move on, you have faith, right? You have forgiveness, you have forgiveness and purification from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, we believers, as nominal as we've been, we confess that nominally, nominally stuff. And God forgives that sin and purifies you from all unrighteousness. Now we're back in grace with God. Open up the door. First thing you do to open up the door to your life with Jesus Christ as a believer is admit your wrongdoing and admit him into a portion of your life that's not right with God. There's always that one portion here or there. And it's some some I have some hard places where I just lose the battle all the time. Just read Romans chapter 7. That was the Apostle Paul while he was a believer. In any case... I say, what he just said here, a nominal Christian who cannot see his need for repentance is a hopeless case. This is an irresponsible statement. Can I make it more emphatic? Yep. First of all, there is no such thing as a nominal Christian. 
One is either saved by grace through a moment of faith alone in Christ alone plus nothing else, and that salvation is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works. You don't go to a nominal heaven. You go to heaven. Now, you've got to have a nominal, perhaps, uh, set of rewards and things to do in heaven for the rest of eternity if you haven't been faithful. So it's, you, well, I wouldn't even want to say nominal, just reduced. So one is not a Christian at all, or one is saved by grace through faith, a moment of faith alone in Christ alone, plus nothing else. Acting poorly has nothing to do with whether or not one is a Christian. One is just an acting poorly Christian. One is to save them to eternal life no matter what. Because it's by grace. Unmerited favor. So you don't have to turn around and, and go in the back door and say, but you have to keep proving it out. At least to me. No. Get your hands off the other guy's Christianity. That's his salvation. And it's between him and God. And he's got the Holy Spirit in him. So if you get the Holy Spirit in him, and you'd be acting nominal, does the Holy Spirit pack his bags and leave? Did, did you get unchilded? Can you unchild yourself in your human life with your parents? Come on. So Revelation 3.17, Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Robert L. Thomas is going to address this, 17, here. The five adjectives describing this church in 3.17. And he says, church now. If there are nominal Christians, they're not church. Why is he calling the word is he a hypocritical himself? You can't describe these people who you don't think are Christians as church anymore. So that makes clear that as a general rule, those in the church had no relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior. Wow. You're measuring their lukewarmness. What do you do about Christians that go to war? Most people are lukewarm about a lot of stuff. They don't let Jesus into their life the whole way when they become say, saved. I don't think I've done a good job at that all my life. Though a few among them may have become genuine in their faith. May have been genuine in their faith. How do you get a genuine faith? I have an ungenuine faith that it's nighttime. I have a genuine faith that it's nighttime. I have nothing to do with it being nighttime. I just accept it what's true. I accept genuinely. No, I just accept. I don't, you can't ungenuine accept something is true. It's the semantical nonsense. It's not in the dictionary. Though a few among them may have been genuine in the faith, the influence of the few in the church was insignificant. That resembles the situation of Sardis. So he thinks everybody around that doesn't persevere in the faith is not a believer. I think he's a, as a Calvinist there. Revelation 3.17, because you say I'm rich and become wealthy and in need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. This verse cannot be interpreted as saying that the church never had a relationship with Christ as Savior. Why then address them as the church? Did not Jesus know that none of them were saved? Did he know that? So he's God, right? He didn't know that? So why tell John to address them as a church when he wrote Revelation? Furthermore, one's behavior is not what saves one. A moment of faith alone in Christ alone is what does. This is a study on salvation. Many studies here, they all corroborate a moment of faith alone in Christ alone plus nothing else, and you have eternal life in you at that moment, in your mortal body, intrinsic part of you. You're all, you have to, you're all you're waiting for is to get that resurrection body exchanged into uh, that old body, exchanged into a resurrection body. Scripture, especially the New Testament epistles, with all of its commands and instructions on how Christians are to conduct themselves, presumes that no believer, even in the church age, will act faithfully all the time. I did that in Calvary Chapel one time. The guy said, oh yeah, I have to do that. And I said, let me get one of your church Bibles out of the pew. And I did. I took the epistles and started to pretend to rip them out. You don't need this then. These are instructions to believers to be faithful. They're automatically persevering the faith because they're genuine believers. Oh, don't, don't destroy it. He thought, you're, you're crazy. Well, the, the theology is crazy, and I made a point. I didn't rip up the Bible, but he thought I might. The judgment seat of Christ addresses those who are faithful and those who are unfaithful and determines that those who are unfaithful will suffer loss of rewards, but not loss of their salvation. Just read that passage, right? Judgment seat of Christ. Look at the judgment. No believer can claim to be all that faithful, i.e. one moment without sin, 1 John 1, 8. Claim to be without sin, you're a deceive, deceive, deceiver, a liar. So the passage in Revelation 3 indicates that Jesus is addressing believers, not false professors or unbelievers, 
Take another look, especially at the under.